Over the last several weeks, we were talking about what's called in English the Apocrypha, uh, what our sages call the Sifrei Chitzonim. So the books that were not included in the Tanakh, they were written in that Second Temple era, but they were excluded from the Tanakh. Some of their status was questionable. Are they holy? Are they not holy? And we discussed already in part one, we kind of discussed how the Tanakh itself was put together based on what criteria and why certain books were excluded. And then last time we addressed whether we're even allowed to study these books, the Sifrei Chitzonim, because there is one opinion that you shouldn't study these books. It's a minority opinion. And generally they were studied, and not only were they studied, as we saw last time and we'll see again today, they were actually quoted extensively by our sages. It's all over the place, in the Talmud, in the Midrash, in the Zohar especially. So uh, many of the books, we already looked at several of those books. The one that we want to focus on today is, I think, the most fascinating, which is called Sefer HaYovlim, the Book of Jubilees. And it's not only the most fascinating one, it was among the most popular books in the Second Temple era. So in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we found at least 15 copies. Okay, so it was very widely read in Second Temple times. Not only that, but even more amazingly, the Ethiopian Jewish community actually had it as part of their Tanakh. They saw it as a, a legitimate book of scripture, of Tanakh, which also adds evidence to the fact that the Ethiopian Jewish community split off from the rest of the kind of Jewish world 2,000 years ago before the temple was destroyed. And although in, in our you know, rabbinic tradition, Jubilees was considered apocryphal and was excluded from Tanakh, and we'll see why. It, there's very obvious and simple reason why. Nonetheless, it is actually quoted perhaps not by name, but there are almost identical passages in later Midrashim and in the Zohar, and there's so much overlap as we are going to see. Okay. And generally, like, how do we approach a book like this? How do you approach Sefer HaYovlim, or the Book of Jubilees? Because on the one hand, it was excluded from the Tanakh. On the other hand, it still has validity. The Ethiopian Jewish community used it. The Chazal clearly knew of it and used it and incorporated it in the Midrash. So it clearly has truthful things, no doubt. There's passages that you can't deny. On the other hand, it's a problematic text, as we'll see. So I think one way to look at it is essentially as a, as a Midrash, as another interpretation of you know, biblical events. It's a Midrash, and, and people would consider it like an early Midrash. And it's important to remember as we go through what the book says, uh, the old saying about Midrash, which is that anybody who denies the validity of Midrash or says it's not true is a heretic, but anybody who thinks that the Midrash is literally true is a fool. That's the old saying with Midrash, right? There's a lot of things in Midrash that you just can't take literally, and it's not meant to be taken literally, it's, it's metaphorical. So on the one hand, you can't deny it completely, it's a legitimate text. On the other hand, you also can't take it 100% literally true. And so that's just keep that in mind as we go through it. Uh, now, the Book of Jubilees presents a type of calendar, and that's the main issue with the Book of Jubilees, is that it presents a different calendar to the one that we're, we're used to. We know we have a calendar that's lunisolar, so our months are lunar, but we also want to keep synchronized with the sun over a 19-year cycle, so we add the months. We all know how this works. So like this year that we just started is going to be a leap year where we're going to have two Adars. Right? And so we stay kind of in sync with both the moon and the sun. Now, Jubilees rejected that. The, the Jubilee calendar says that we should go strictly solar. Like they, they, go, they have a calendar that's not based on the moon, really. It's not based on uh, uh, proclaiming the months as they used to do in the Sanhedrin. It gives a calendar that's 364 days, four seasons of 91 days, a calendar that's exactly 52 weeks. Okay, so that gives you 364 days. So each season is 13 weeks, each season is 91 days, and you have a year of 364 days. Now that's a problem. Like that calendar can't work because how can you, a, a solar year is 365.24 days. So how do, how do they account for that missing day and a quarter, it's not clear. The, nobody seems to be able to really figure that. Various theories have been proposed, but the Book of Jubilees itself doesn't explain how do they keep stay in sync with the sun because they'd always, they'd always be off by a day and, and a quarter. 
Now, what, what this calendar allows them to do, though, because it's so exact, is that they're able to celebrate the holidays like on the same day of the week every year. And Jubilees makes the case, and this is the big problem with the book of Jubilees, that, and this is how it really starts, is that Shavuot, it was on the 15th of Sivan. Okay, this was the big calendar debate 2,000 years ago. When do you, how do you count Sfirat Omer? Because the Torah says that we're supposed to count 50 days, Mimacharat Shabbat, right? From the day after Shabbat. So the Torah doesn't tell us what day and a specific date for the holiday of Shavuot. It just says to count 50 days from Pesach, from the Shabbat of Pesach. So what does that actually mean? So our tradition is that Pesach itself is a Shabbat, of course, because we keep a Yom Tov. Yom Tov is a Shabbat. So we start counting from the second day of Pesach, meaning the first Yom Tov from the second day, that's already Mimacharat Shabbat. You start counting 50 days and you get to the sixth of Sivan. So we celebrate Shavuot on the sixth of Sivan. But there were Jews in the Second Temple time that said, no, Mimacharat Shabbat means literally the day after Shabbat, right? They would liter- read it literally, and like the Essenes would do, for instance. And so they would keep, they would start counting from the day after the first Shabbat. So they would always start counting on a Sunday, which means Shavuot would always be on a Sunday, and Shavuot would always be on the 15th of Sivan. And the, Jubilee cal- and the book of Jubilees builds a whole rich tradition around this date, around the day of the 15th of Sivan. So that's the reason why it was excluded, because it clearly contradicted the, the uh, authentic uh, Jewish calendar, the rabbinic calendar. That's why it, it couldn't be included in the Tanakh, and so the book was really in some ways suppressed. But aside from that calendar issue, it has a lot of interesting information, and actually, like a Midrash, gives support and fills in a lot of the details in the Torah. So it's really fascinating to read and see. And again, you can see it as, uh, approach it like a Midrash that fills in some of the missing details of the Torah. And it's really fascinating. So we're going to go right into it and see what it says. It starts like this. Chronology of the, of the world, of the days. So it's going to basically give us an entire history of the world. The Book of Jubilees wants to give us a history of the world in segments of Shemitot, of sabbaticals, and Jubilees, of a Yovel. Okay? As God told Moses on Sinai. So the Book of Jubilees claims to be uh, something that Moshe received on Har Sinai. Yeah. So that God gave this information through perhaps an angel to Moses while Moses was on Har Sinai. This was in the first year when the Israelites came out of Egypt. Which is Sivan. So on the 16th of Sivan. So this is the day after the Sinai revelation. So according to Jubilees, Shavuot was on the 15th of, of Sivan. And so the very next day, Moses is up on Mount Sinai and God reveals to him the history of the world. And that's what the book of Jubilees wants to present to us. It wants to present the history of the world from Genesis, from creation, from Bereshit, up until the Sinai revelation. And it does that in segments of Jubilees. Okay. So remember, what's a Jubilee? What's a Yovel? 50 years, right? The Torah commands that we count seven years and every seventh year is a Shemitah, is a sabbatical, and we count seven of those sabbaticals, so 49 years, and then the following 50th year is the Jubilee year. It's a very special year. You proclaim freedom in the land. All people return to their ancestral lands, so the slaves go free, and so on. So that's a Jubilee. So the book of Jubilees actually divides up all of Genesis, all of the history of the world up until Moses into Jubilees, into segments of 50. And it tells you, Actually, they're not segments of 50, they're segments of 49. Because it, when we count the Jubilee, the 50th year is already the first year of the next cycle. Okay? So it's like there's year 49. It's not 49, then 50, and then 1. It's 49, 50, and 50 is already the first year of the new cycle. So it's actually 49-year cycles. And so Jubilees gives 50, gives the history of the first 50 Jubilees of creation. Yeah, so 50 times 49 is 2,450 years, right? The first 2450 years of the world. And in our tradition, in what year did the Sinai revelation occur? In what year did the Bnei Israel come out of Egypt, according to our calendar, the official date? 
2448, right? The year 2448 in, on, in our chronology is when we receive the Torah. So the dates actually match up pretty close, right? Jubilee is giving us the first 2450 years of history. Yeah, according to Jubilees, the Torah was given, it's a bit off, in the year 2410, so it gives a little earlier date, and that the Israelites entered the Holy Land at 2450. At the conclusion of 50 Jubilees, the Israelites entered the Holy Land. So that's kind of the overall structure that the book of Jubilees presents, and when it tells us the events of things, it actually says, in this Jubilee, in this Shemitah of this Jubilee, that's when this happened. So it's actually really useful in giving you like an exact chronology of when certain events happened. Okay? And then it starts by going into creation, into Bereshit, and it says very specifically what happened on each day. It starts by saying that on day one of creation, God created seven things. What are the seven things that God created on day one? Shamayim Ba'aret, right? Shamayim Ba'aret is the first two, and then? First there was water, right? So there's ruach, there's spirit, there's maim, there's water, and then... Did he create water though? Well, he must have. Where did it come from? He must have created it. <laughs> so Jubilee says that he created it because it's there. So he made spirit. So heaven, earth, spirit, water, tehom. So it says tehom, the abyss, right? And darkness and light. Those are the seven things. Now, this is one passage that's in the Midrash quotes, because in Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, it's a very almost identical teaching, and it says the same thing, except it just splits Tehom into Tohu Vavo. Right? So that's what Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer says. So again, we see something, this is the first example of a Midrash, of one of our Midrashim, actually overlapping, perhaps quoting, but certainly overlapping nearly exactly with the book of Jubilees. Okay. So there's seven things it says that he created on day one. And then it goes like that and says everything that was created on each day. So total, how many things were created over the span of the seven days? Set the, the book of Jubilee says there were 22 things. God created 22 things corresponding to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, corresponding to the 22 generations from Adam Rishon to Yaakov Avinu. Because you have from Adam to Noah was 10 generations. From Noah to Abraham is 10 generations. And then Isaac, Jacob, that's 22. So you think there's 22 generations corresponding to the 22 letters of the alphabet, corresponding to the 22 things God created. It's a very nice thing. And not only that, it says, therefore, it says God had prohibited on Shabbat 22 melachot. So, of course, we say that there's 39 melachot. Jubilee says there's 22 melachot, but it's actually not a problem because they're pretty much identical. It's just that Jubilee groups them together. So like one of the melachot is it says nothing that has to, you're not allowed to do anything that has to do with cooking or preparing food. So we split that into several, right? The whole like seder apat, like making bread. So they just group it into one. So overall though, it's pretty much the same melachot. So it'll say, Levali asubo davar mikol tzarchem, velo yasubo kol ma'achal. Right, so the whole thing of eruvin, of not caring, uh, not cooking, right, not to move things from house to house, and then later in the book it adds all, all the other things that it says. Uh, not to go, let's set bo darko, right? Not to go on a long journey, as we know that's also forbidden to go more than like two thousand amot outside of your community. And so basically the list of 22, not to slaughter animals, not to trap animals. So the, the overlaps, they pretty much are almost identical. The only thing that's, that the Book of Jubilees adds that we don't have explicitly in the 39 list is Asher Yasem Milchama Beyom Shabbat, so not to go to war on Shabbat. It adds that as one of the 22 Melachot is not to go to war. And this is the one that's the, the most for sure the most at odds with rabbinic tradition, which is uh, So a man is not allowed to actually be intimate with his wife. Procreation was forbidden according to the, the book of Jubilees. Why? Because procreation is a creative act, right? Technically. So because it's a creative act, the book of Jubilees and the Essenes who followed the book of Jubilees uh, actually avoided intimacy on Shabbat. 
That's here, yes. It says here not to, not to, that's one of the 22 also, not lighting a fire and all that stuff. Does that bunch so. up with, with cooking? No, that's separate. That's a separate one of not lighting a fire, yeah. So the, the glaring difference is, is really just this one, which in rabbinic tradition is it's perfectly acceptable, but uh, here it says procreation would be forbidden as a creative act. So other than that, though, everything overlaps, which is really nice to see. Then we go into the creation. So I'm just like skipping ahead. I'm going to pull out some of the most interesting things here. And then it goes into the creation of Adam and Eve. And here it says something that's very different than in terms of chronology. Because how do we say like the, the classic, let's say, Talmudic approach to the creation of Adam and Eve, the chronology and the creation of Adam and Eve? When were they created? On the sixth day. On the sixth day. And when did they eat, consume the fruit? On the same day. Right? So the Talmud has a passage that basically says every hour they did, you know, Adam and Eve did stuff, something, or Adam did something and then Eve was created and that everything happened on the sixth day. Now, on a practical level, that's hard to take literally. Like all of that stuff happened so quickly, right? Like they just, they just met and they did all these things like within a span of not even 24 hours. It's like in, within a span of like six hours. Right? So do we take that Chazal passage like exactly literally? It's hard to, like practically it would be hard to take that literally. Uh, but the, the Book of Jubilees has a different approach to this. It actually expands it by a very long margin. So it says, Adam was created in the first week. Eve was created in the second week. And then Adam, it says, was brought into the temple uh, sorry, into the Garden of Eden, but you'll see why it's a temple. Adam was brought into the Garden of Eden after 40 days, and Eve was brought into the Garden of Eden after 80 days. According to Jubilees. According to Jubilees, of course. So, so, where they before? so that's a good question. We're going to get to that. Where were they before that? Now, why does it say this? It's very interesting. It says this because, does this, do these numbers sound familiar? One week, two weeks, 40 days, 80 days. That's right. Parashat Tazriya. Parashat Tazriya, what does it say? Right. It says for a week, she's impure seven days. Then she brings a sacrifice and she has to wait 33 more days for 40 days, right? And then she's allowed to go to the temple and she's considered pure and all, all that. And it says for a girl, what does it say? Double. Right? In Parashat Tazriya, it says that for a girl, she's impure for two weeks. Then she does her thing and then she has to wait 66 days, right? And then after 80 days, she's now permitted back in all aspects of holiness. So the book of Jubilees actually quotes, goes directly back to Parashat Tazria and says, this is why Tazria says these things. Why does the Torah say that for a man it's seven days and 40 and for a girl, meaning for a, a baby boy, it's seven and 40 and for a baby girl, it's 14 and 80? Because that's how it was with Adam and Eve. Because Adam was created in the first week, waited, then in day 40 he was brought into the Garden of Eden, and Eve was two weeks, and then she was brought into the Garden of Eden on, after 80 days. And so it makes that connection between the temple and the Garden of Eden, and this is like the spiritual reason why for a boy that's born you would have to wait 40 days, for a girl, 80 days. Now, the Zohar actually says about, you know, the whole, the Zohar's explanation for why it's interesting to mention, you know, the Zohar's explanation for Parashat Tazria, why is it 40 and 80? It actually says that's how long it takes for the soul to settle within the body. And so like the soul is entering, coming into this like a physical form. And for a male soul, it takes 40 days to settle in the body. And for a female soul, it takes 80 days to settle in the body. Presumably because a female soul is, has certain greater powers. It has the ability to actually produce children, right? It's like the final thing that God created was the woman. And so the Zohar says that a woman has more spiritual potential. And so it takes longer for the female soul to settle in the body. And it also applies to the mother because the mother is the one that carried this child. So when the mother gave birth to the child and lost that kind of soul, then it also takes that many days for the mother's soul to recover from that ordeal of delivering, of carrying the child and delivering the child. So both for the baby, that's now this new soul getting settled in the body, and for the mother, that's lost this soul from, from her body, and she needs to recover. So that's where the 40, that's according to what the Zohar says, that's where the 40 and 80 comes from. 
Okay, now how long were Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden according to Jubilee? So we, again, our tradition is that everything happened on the sixth day. Jubilee is spreading this out very long. Right? So it says that Adam and Eve were in the garden. They were there for seven years. Wow. The book of Jubilees argues that Adam and Eve were in the garden of Eden for seven years before these events, the events that followed. And they worked in the garden. And they were naked, of course. They were naked and unashamed. And after all that, and it was Bechodesh Hasheni, which is Iyar. Bechodesh Hasheni, Beshiva Asarbo, on the 17th of Iyar, Ve'yavo HaNachash, Ve'ikarev Elaisha. So it was after seven years, after they spent one Shemitah in the Garden of Eden, then in the second Shemitah, the beginning of the second Shemitah, in the month of Iyar, that's when the Nachash came to Adam and Eve. That's according to Jubilees. Very interesting. So it spreads it out much, much longer. So there's also other sources that state that you know, there's a, an issue with Zohana, Rabbi Nachash. So this makes a lot more sense, really. It, it makes sense in the, in, the, in the sense that it gives more time for events to happen. Right, That's right. All. And these are events that are reported yeah. by other... Like... Again, even, even the Talmudic passage that everything happened on the sixth day, there is like a more Kabbalistic way to explain that, which is that we are still in the sixth day. Like meaning in the cosmic clock, we're still in the sixth day, uh-huh. right? And we're awaiting like the final messianic age, which is the final seventh day, the millennium. Because, you know, the Torah says that this happened on the sixth day, and then the story just kind of continues with Adam and Eve. And it never tells us again how much time elapsed. So it's almost like we've, we're, we've always just been in the sixth day. So it's almost like in the grand cosmic clock that we're still in the sixth day. So that is a way of interpreting that Talmudic passage more mystically and not necessarily that it was like literally everything took place within six hours. And then after they were expelled from the garden, the Book of Jubilee says that they went to a land called Vayeshuba Eretz Eldad, the land of Eldad, presumably somewhere close to the Garden of Eden, and that's where Ba'aretz Asher Nivra Usham, that's where they were originally created before they were brought into the Garden of Eden. Yeah, that's what it says. And it says that they didn't have children. Again, contrary to rabbinic tradition, Okay, so they didn't have a child until actually the first jubilee was, was complete. Until the first jubilee year. Hmm? So 40, yeah, the 50th year, meaning, yeah, 40 year, 49 years past, the 50th year is the jubilee. So that's when they had their first child. And then it goes in detail, and it says, So meaning, in the third Shemitah cycle, of the second jubilee, uh, she gave birth Yaldait Kain, Uverevi Yaldait Hevel. So then in the next Shemitah, she gave birth to Hevel, Uverechamishi Yaldait Bita Aven. So she had a daughter named Aven. So here, the jubilee is going to go into and tell us the names of their daughters. Again, we know in rabbinic tradition, this is where they do, again, agree. In rabbinic tradition, we say that Cain and Abel and Shet married their sisters. And Jubilees agrees with that and even gives them names, says what the names of their sisters were and then who they married. So that's something that it does agree with rabbinic does tradition. Say about Adam, it does. Yes, it does. It does. It, yes, it does. It says that he had more children. And wow. Jubilee specifies how many. Jubilee says, Adam wow. That she gave, she, he would go on to have, the Torah doesn't say how many, it just yeah. said he had many more. And Jubilee said he had nine more. Okay, that's it's what. After Shed or where? Yes, after Shed, he had nine. Nine after the daughter? Nine more children after Plus, the Plus, yeah, nine more boys nine after more Shed. Children. Yeah, and presumably other daughters. Yeah. 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 yeah, which you can see the connection to Yaakov, right? So Adam would have had 12 kids, sorry, 12 sons. So you see like another parallel there, the connection between Adam. And, you know, our sages really say that Yaakov's face was like the face of Adam. That there's a connection to Adam, that Yaakov's face was like Adam. So Jubilees also reinforces that connection between the very first man and Yaakov, you know, the father of Israel. Okay, now the, the book of Jubilees gets into something very, very interesting. And this is something that's very popular on the internet today. A lot of people really like uh, this whole field of the whole idea of, have you heard of the Watchers? These angels called the Watchers? It's here in Jubilees in, in detail. Okay, the whole story of these angels called the Watchers, the fallen angels. Have you heard of the fallen, the, the fallen angels idea? This is what it says. 
Right, so it's going to get into all of that stuff. The fallen angels, the Nephilim, the giants, the Bnei HaElohim, and all that stuff. So this is what it says. So in the 10th Jubilee, in the second sabbatical of the 10th Jubilee, that's one of the people that's mentioned in the genealogy of Adam. Dina. <clears throat> Uh, Bat Berachel, so his wife whose name was Dina, Bat Achot Aviv, okay, he married her, Bataled Loben, and this, his name was Vaikrait Shmo, who, what was his name, anybody remember? The son of Me'alalel is Yared, Jared, right, Jared. Jared, Yared, why was he called Yared? What does Yared mean? To, to come down, literally to come down. Why was he called, why was his, his name Yared? Ki beyamav yardu malachei Hashem hanikraim shomrim. The angels of God who were called the watchers or the guardians, the, the guardians of man. Al Ha'aretz, they came down to earth. Lelamedet bnei adam mishpat u'meisharim le'asotam ba'aretz. So they came down to earth to watch over the humans and to teach them all kinds of things, right? To teach them the law and to teach them how to be just and upright. And then, then Yared got married. He married a girl, a woman named Bracha. Okay, Bracha bat Retzutzel, bat Achot Aviv. Okay, b'Shavu Arvi, v'Teled Lo Ben b'Shavu Achamishi. And what was his son? Who is the son of Jared of Yared? That's the famous Chanoch. Okay, Chano Enoch. That's right. Enoch who went to walk with God and disappeared. Right? The Torah says, the Torah lists the genealogies of Adam. It says how long everybody lived and died. But with Enoch, it doesn't say he died. It says how long he lived and yeah. Right. God took him. So in our tradition, in the more Kabbalistic texts, he became the angel Metatron. And we're going to talk about that. There is a separate apocryphal book called the Book of Enoch, Sifra de Chanoch which is parallel to the Book of Jubilees. And the Zohar actually directly quotes from the Book of Enoch. It actually says, Ube sifra de chanoch. In the Book of Enoch, it says this and this and this. And the Zohar quotes it dozens and dozens of times. And it overlaps with Jubilees. Some people say it was actually written by the same person. Uh, it has a lot of the same details. So that I want to leave for next time to focus on, to do a whole class specifically on Metatron and the Book of Enoch. So that's for next time. But this is where uh, Enoch comes into being. Uh, he is the son of, of Yared. So in the generation right after these angels came down to earth, he was the first to know, you know the, the, the divine language and how to write and scripture. He was the first wise man. He, did, he revealed all the secrets of the calendar and of astrology. So he taught mankind how to count the years and the calendars. And the book of Enoch says that it was the watchers who taught him all of this information. Uh, and uh, So he wrote the first history books and he taught them how and how to calculate the jubilees and the sabbaticals. So he was the first one who brought this out. Uh, and he wrote what happened in the past and also what will happen in the end of days. So he was like the first prophet. Okay. He saw everything. He was this first great prophet. So he wrote it all in his books. And he placed it before Bnei Adam Ledorotehem. And he married a woman named Edni, but Daniel. Right? His son was Methuselah, who was the longest living person in the Torah. He lived 969 years, longer than anybody else. And then this is where it gets really interesting. So it says, Enoch, that Enoch was with the angels for six years. Uh, so they taught him basically everything. And he wrote it in a book. And, and then, this is where, this is the fallen angels part. He is the one, and he is the one that went up to heaven to testify against the angels that started to mate with humans. No, Chanoch. 
the Enoch. Enoch was the one that testified against those watchers that went off the derech and mated with humans. Because as the Torah says in uh, Bereshit chapter 6 verse 4, exactly. And the filim hayu ba'aretz bayamim ha'em. That in those days there were nefilim on, in the world. These bnei ha'elohim, whoever that is, children of God, children of angels, uh, came to the daughters of man. Right? We know that it's a little one line in the Torah, and the Torah doesn't really explain it. And it's like baffling. Right? Like, what does that mean that the bnei ha'elohim, literally the sons of God, apparently, uh, often interpreted as angels. The people who want to be like the most rationalist and ignore all of the stuff about angels and fallen angels say B'nai Elohim just means great people. Like Elohim can also mean great judges, great leaders. So B'nai Elohim just means like people who were the elites. The elites of society married the poor girls of man, took advantage of the impoverished women. That's like the most kind of rationalistic explanation. But in the Zohar and in Midrash and in the Book of Jubilees and in many other places, this is taken quite literally as angels actually mated with humans. And so this is, it was Hanukh who actually went up to heaven to testify against these watchers who were supposed to be protecting humans and uh, their Yetzirah apparently overcame them, as we shall see, and he testified against them. And that would set... So their children were giants. So we're going to get into that right now. And so it, this is uh, put the wheels in motion for God to bring about the flood, right? And wipe out all of mankind and all of these hybrid progeny. Okay. Adam died. It's, it's just going to continue and say that Adam died and all his sons buried him. And he was the first. It actually says that he was the first. He was the first to, be, to die and be buried by his children. I mean, Hevel was killed before, but he was the first to, be, to have a funeral. And, it's, and it explains why he lived 930 years. The Torah tells us that Adam lived 930 years. Why 930? Well, it doesn't say that here. In rabbinic tradition, Adam gave 70 years to King David, who lived 70 years. Here it says, why was he short by 70 years? Because, as we read in Tehilim, ki elef shanim keyom echad, elef shanim be'enecha keyom etmol, that a thousand years for in the heavens is like one day, the other way, a thousand years on earth is like one day in the heavens. And so, since God told him, the day that you eat from the tree, on that day you will die, God meant in a heavenly day. A heavenly day is a thousand years. So God wasn't, you know, God fulfilled his promise, meaning he died on within a thousand years. He didn't live to see the completion of that day. So he was a bit shy of a one heavenly day. Okay, so he lived 930 years and not a full 1,000. Okay. And then it says in the same year, Cain was killed or died or was killed in the same year. How was he killed? Very interesting. It says, Beiton nafalalav that Cain's house, he collapsed upon him. Vayamot betoch beito, vayumat bekerev avanav, that the stones of his house collapsed on him and killed him. This is again at odds with rabbinic tradition, which says... It's, it's, it's that, uh, this is where I found it a little bit odd, because I think even it contradicts some of the things in the Torah itself. No, the Torah doesn't say. The, the, the Torah doesn't say that Cain was killed by Tuval Cain, his you know, great-grandson. That's a rabbinic tradition. No. So what the Torah says is Cain killed heaven, and then Cain was banished to wander. Yeah. But he didn't really wander because he built a city. No, no, and right. then it's generations it's later... It's no, no. Right. Generations later, it says Lamech was with his son Tuval Cain. And uh, Lamech in rabbinic tradition, Lamech did something wrong. The Torah doesn't say what he was grieving. The rabbinic tradition fills in that he was blind and he was out hunting with his son. So Cain was killed by an arrow shot by his own descendant. That's the rabbinic tradition. That's how he, in Jubilees, but the Torah doesn't say that. Right? So the Torah doesn't say how Cain, how Cain died. Jubilee says he died because his house collapsed on him. And this was done, why? Midah keneged midah. Ki be'even hemit et hevel, uve'even humat. Gamhu. Because he killed hevel with a stone, 
you know, he, he, I guess he hit him with a stone and killed his brother with a stone. Therefore, midah keneged midah, he was killed by stones. Al pi mishpat tzedek, because this is God's justice. This is God's righteousness. God's midah keneged midah. That's what it says. And then the angels became wicked. It says, And this is what the Torah says, The Jubilees explains that the Bnei HaElohim are the angels of God. So the angels of God saw the daughters of man, because they are beautiful. And they had children. And those children, were the Nephilim. The Nephilim were these giant, apparently giant children that were born, the hybrid offspring of angels and human women. And God got very upset. And God's wrath, uh, it was ignited against the angels that he had originally sent to earth, and he decided to destroy them. Okay. And he actually took them and bound them to the center of the earth. Hinam uh, asurim betocham, and he bound them in the middle of the earth somewhere. Have you heard that before? Who, who in rabbinic tradition was bound in the wilderness? What do we do on Yom Kippur? This is fitting because we have Yom Kippur now coming up. What did we do on Yom Kippur? On Yom Kippur, they would take two goats, right? One would be sacrificed, and one would be sent to Azazel to the wilderness, the scapegoat, the famous scapegoat. So this is fitting to talk about this now. They used to take one goat and send it to Azazel. What is Azazel? So our sages say Azazel was an angel, was one of these fallen angels, according to one tradition anyways, according to one opinion. Azazel was one of these fallen angels that God bound in the wilderness. And Azazel was the one that taught mankind various sins. He was one of these fallen angels that taught mankind to sin. And so they sent a goat, le Azazel, a seir le Azazel, to atone for the sins of those fallen angels, for those watchers, the Nephilim, and so on. That's what the, that scapegoat was for. One goat was to atone for our sins, and the other goat was to atone for the sins of the watchers who taught mankind how to sin. And Azazel was the name of this angel. In another rabbinic tradition, this is mentioned everywhere. It's in the Gemara, it's in the Midrash, it's in the Zohar. It was actually two angels. One was called Aza, and one was called Azael, and combined, they are called Azazel. Okay, that's another, and this is what the Zohar says. The Zohar says in one place, the Zohar speaks about this in many places. I just pulled up basically the first one, I think, in Bereshit. Azza and Azael were these two angels who, when God said, when God said, Na'ase Adam betzalmenu, when God said, let us make man, these angels came and said, Ma Adam, what do you need man for? Right? We, you have us angels, don't create man. So they were the ones that led this kind of protest and they told God, they didn't want God to make mankind, Azan, Azan. And uh, ultimately, they came down to earth themselves. And the, the Zohar actually says, <laughs> Because these angels came, and they actually sinned, ultimately, with the, they were brought down to earth. And the Balaturim says this as well. On that verse in Genesis, where that talks about the Nephilim, the Balaturim says it was the angels Shem Chazai ve Azael, Naflumin Hashamayim, Be'yamei Doha Mabul. So this is not some like hidden, forbidden teaching. It's all over the place. The Balaturim quotes it, the Talmud quotes it, the Zohar quotes it, the Midrash quotes it. Yalkut Shimoni gives us even more details. The Midrash Yalkut Shimoni says, Kevan Shem Du Doha Mabul ve Avdu Avodazara, Aya Kadosh Baruch Mita'atsev. So when the, when the people in the flood generation were sinning, that's when the angels Shem Chazai and Azael came to God and said, why did you bother making, we told you not to make humans. Why did you bother making humans? We told you they'd be sinful. And what did God tell them? He said, If you would have been there, You'd be even worse than humans. Right? You're only saying that because you're here with me in heaven. But if you angels were down there on earth, your Yetzirah would be even worse. And that's exactly what he did. They told him, Ten lanu reshut give, give us permission and we want to go down to heaven and show you how we'll be righteous. Uh, to earth, thank you. Give us permission to go down to earth and we'll be, we'll be holy. 
and Anu Mekadshin Shmecha, we'll sanctify your name. And he said, Amar Lehem Redu V'taduru Imayen, go for it. And what do you think happened when Shem Chazai and Azael came down? That's the Midrash says, not Jubilees. The Midrash, our Midrash, our holy Midrash says, Miyad Kalkalu Im Bnot Adam. Immediately, they couldn't hold themselves. And, and they sinned with the daughters of man. And they could not conquer their evil inclination. So even the angels sinned. So again, this is something that's widespread. Okay? This is something that rabbinic tradition totally agrees with, that there were these angels who were originally made to watch over man. They're called Shomrim. In Aramaic, they're mentioned in the book of Daniel, in the Tanakh. In the, in the Tanakh, anybody knows what they're called in the Tanakh? They're called in Aramaic, Irin. Irin. Okay, they're the watchers. So Dan, the, in the Sefer Daniel, they're called Irin in Aramaic. So this is a, a very legitimate thing. And then Jubilees describes the flood in detail. And that's when the giants and all these hybrid offspring were destroyed. By the way, in, in our tradition, we often speak of only two angels, like Aza, Azael, Azazel, Shem Chazai. The names are a little bit different. But in other books, they actually say there's as many as 200 of them. And these were just the leaders. Shem Chazai and Azael or Azazel, they were just the leaders. But there were over 200 of these angels. And the Michael and the... They weren't. They didn't sin. No. Michael, those, the Seraphim didn't participate in this. Yeah. So they were Michael, Gabriel. They didn't come down. No, they didn't. No, no, they didn't. Those were different angels. Michael, Gabriel, Raphael were not a part of this. Okay. And then the flood came and the book of Jubilees again wants to tie... Uh, wants to show why the 15th of Sivan is the correct date. So it has this agenda to prove that the 15th of Sivan is the legitimate day of Shavuot, the day when God made a covenant with us. So it says that Noah also made a covenant with God, with the seven Noahide laws and everything, on the 15th of Sivan. That's when he saw the rainbow. That's when he made a covenant with God. The book of Jubilees does actually speak about the seven Noahide laws. It doesn't number them as seven, but it does give Noahide laws. It says that Vayad bevanav tzedek, that Noah told his children, whatever it was, that they should be just, lechasot basar ervatam, that they should be modest and cover their nakedness, ulevarechet boram, and to honor Hashem. But here there are some differences with our Noahide laws, because it says, ulechabedet av ve'etaem. One of the Noahide laws here is to also honor your father and mother, uh, and to love your fellow, leov ishet re'eu, and to love your fellow, velishmor et nafshotem mikol znunim, and not to participate in any sexual sins, gilu arayot, which is in our Noahide laws, and of course not to eat blood and ever minachai, the limbs of a live animal, and not to consume the, the blood of an animal. Jubilees includes consuming the blood of an animal in ever minachai. And it goes on to say that the reason why these, Noah made these seven laws is because these were the sins that the people in the pre-flood generation sinned with. They didn't love each other. They didn't honor each other. They consumed animal blood. They killed each other. They committed sexual sin. And therefore, God exterminated them. So we should not do those things anymore. So the Noahide laws are here, slightly different. And it actually mentions three categories of Nephilim. It says that there was, that these three categories were killing each other. That Ha'anak hemit et anapil, et anafil, ve'anafil, that they were all killing each other. There were Anakim, Nephilim, Elionim, and humans, four categories, and they were all fighting each other, warring with each other. Now, the Elionim are probably the same as the Torah calls them Rephaim. There are Rephaim, right? So Anakim is in the Torah. Bnei Elohim was the original Shomrim that came down to earth. Yeah. Yeah, so then you have the Nephilim were their offspring, then you have Anakim, the next genera- one more generation, and then the Rephaim, one more generation. And the Zohar actually explains, so now connecting to the Zohar, the Zohar explains the difference between them. Rav Chia, Amar, Tlat, Shmaha, Nekron, they have three names, Nephilim, Anakim, Rephaim. Why? Uh, all of them were, it says, Oche, Yome, they lived long lives. But Nephilim, the original ones were Nephilim. And then when they mated with the daughters of man, their offspring were Anakim. And then finally, after they mated again, they were Rephaim. Because Rephaim, what does Rephaim literally mean? Weak. They were the weak ones. Meaning, with each generation, they were getting weaker and weaker. All right? So the final generation were the weakest of the bunch. Okay. So when Israel, when, when, when the Nephilim when the came into Israel, they said they were Anakim. 
Yeah, yeah. They they exactly. Saw. Yeah. So they, these are offsprings of Rafaim, or these they saw the Rafaim, Bnei Anak. Right. Yeah. Og and Sihon were Rafaim. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Og was one of the Rafaim. So actually, uh, the Midrash says that Og was a grandson of Shem Chazai. Chazal say that Og was the grandson of Shem Chazai, what the leading angel that came down. Wow. So that's exactly how it goes, like three generations down. Then Jubilees goes to say how, so now all those Nephilim, Anakim, Elionim, or Rephaim were all destroyed. Noah repopulated the world, as we know, and his sons split the world between them. They took Goralot, just like later, Israel, the Israelites, the tribes of Israel, did lotteries to determine who should get what. Shem, Ham, and Yefet took lotteries and apportioned all the territories between them. And here it says something really interesting but very important, which also fits in with rabbinic tradition. What, how did Kna'an, who's a son of Ham, Ham received basically what's Africa for the most part, and Shem received the Holy Land. So how did Kna'an suddenly settle the Holy Land? So it says, Vekna'an ra'a et Eretz Levanon ad Nachal Mitzrayim. He saw the Holy Land from the Lebanon to Egypt, to the river of Egypt, which is actually not the Nile River, but there's another river in the Sinai Peninsula. Kitovahi me'od, the land was very good. And so what did he do? He went and he conquered it. He conquered the land that wasn't his. Ve'eshev be'aretz le'eretz Lebanon mi'mizrach u mi'ma'arav. So he settled that land with his family. So his brothers, Kush and Mitzrayim, and his father, Ham, said, You took a land that's not yours. It doesn't belong to us. We didn't get this land. That's Shem's land. You conquered it. You should not do this. You will be cursed. Because you are now starting this conquest thing. We, everything was peaceful till now. And now you're starting war again and conquest. And you will be cursed if you take this land. And your progeny will be cursed. And they will be conquered. And here it says a very popular adage, proverb, saying that we've all heard. This is the source in the book of Jubilees. Ki bechozek acherev nechastem ubecheskat acherev yiplu. Because those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. Right? That comes right from Jubilees. Because you held by the sword, you will fall by the sword. Right? That's what they told him. But he did it anyways. So that sets up the whole thing of Kna'an being cursed and taking over a land that's not his and justifying the children of Israel, the descendants of Shem, to reconquer their land. And then, this is also really interesting, after that, of course, the next major event is Migdal Bavel, the Tower of Babel. Doesn't say much that we don't, doesn't really say anything extra that we don't already know, but it's interesting that it tells us how long it took them to build Migdal Bavel. And that's really important, actually, because it ties into a beautiful Arizal. Very nice, and it's worth sharing, just this one line. Because it says, how long do you think it took to build the, the Tower of Babel? And Jubilee says the Tower of Babel was massive. It was like several kilometers into the sky, uh, it was something serious. And we discussed that before, like I think a year ago, about various opinions, like Rav Yonatan Ibeshut said that it was like a spaceship, right? That it was meant to fly out to space. So it, it was supposed to, it was more than just a tower. Uh, they knew what they were doing. They had some ancient secrets. And the, the Book of Jubilee says they rediscovered ancient secrets from the Watchers. Right, in Tzubika Be'eret Shina. Yeah, they discovered something in Shina. And so how long did it take them to build this whatever it was, it spaceship. Is. It says, It took 43 years to build. Now, why is that important? It's important because the Arizal says something really amazing. It connects perfectly to what the Arizal says. The Arizal says, who, who are these people? Uh, it's a really long story. I don't want to get into it. It goes back to Adam being 130 years childless and producing various spirits. Um, and the Arizal says that those souls that Adam produced in those 130 years came back into physical bodies. They were the generation of the tower. They sinned, and then they were reincarnated again in the Egyptians. It, when, when the Israelites came to Egypt, the Egyptians that were there were, were reincarnations of the tower generation. That's actually why Yosef had them all circumcised. You remember that that story in the Torah that Yosef, Yosef when Yosef became the president of Egypt 
and right. the, eventually when the famine started and the people had nothing, no food, and they asked him for food, so he gave them food, and then they, they kept asking for more and more, and ultimately he had them all circumcised. Really? Yes, what the Egyptians. This? So the, this is the Arizal in Shalab Sukim. He's saying that uh, because it came from a wasted seed of Adam in those 130 years, lechen gazar alem mitzvat milah, that Yosef had the Egyptians circumcised, let the ken ktsat, to fix partly Avon Shosham, that original sin that they had from Adam. So he had them all circumcised. And then those circumcised Egyptians, by the way, we have hieroglyphics, Egyptian wall paintings of Egyptians getting circumcised. What? Yes. In ancient Egypt, they, there was circumcision. You can see uh, wall paintings in Egyptian temples from thousands of years ago that they would circumcise. So this, is, this does have actual archaeological proof. So the Arizal says Yosef had them circumcised to start the tikkun, to rectify. Then he says, the same souls, And those souls were reincarnated in the children of Israel that were born in Egypt and were enslaved. And then, And then they had to work hard. Why did they have to be slaves in Egypt? This is amazing. Because the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. Why? God doesn't do anything. Everything is measure for measure. God wouldn't punish somebody if they didn't deserve it. Which means the Israelites being slaves in Egypt had to be slaves. Like they had to suffer. They did something to merit that suffering. And the Arizal says, why did they merit to build, to be buildings, builders of temples and whatever? Why? Because in the tower generation, they were building for an evil purpose. God had them reincarnated to build, to repair what they sinned. And so that's why this is a perfect connection to the book of Jubilees, because... How long were Bnei Israel actually slaves building in Egypt? It wasn't 400 years. 89 years or 80 years? It was 86 years, 86. right? And it's the gematria of Kos. We drink Arba Kosot, four cups on Pesach. The gematria of Kos is 86. It's an easy way to remember. Because they were supposed to be there for 400 years, but we know that God shortened it. They ended up only being there 400 years, counting from the birth of Yitzchak. The Israelites were in Egypt total 210 years. And out of those 210 years, they were only slaves for 86 years. So why is that perfect with the Book of Jubilees? Because the Book of Jubilees says it took 43 years to build Migdal Babel. You got double 86 years to build to fix your sin from a past life. So I think this Jubilees fits with the Arizal nicely. Anyway, it's a, it's the, the Arizal itself is beautiful. And he talks about the Arizal has this in many places in the Kitvei HaArizal. So this one is from Shara Sukim. So it gives you like a reason for why the Israelites have to be slaves and what does it have to do with anyway. Awesome. Very nice. Okay. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to go very quickly through Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and then, and we'll end with Acharit Yamim because everybody wants to hear about Acharit Yamim. And Jubilees has a whole passage about the end of days. So it says about Avraham that he began to pray to God and he separated from his father when he was 14 and it says that Avraham was famous because he was a great inventor. The book of Jubilee says Avraham invented a way to repel birds from eating the seeds of farmers, some new technology. He invented a seed scatterer attached to a plow. He all kinds of stuff. Avraham was apparently, according to Jubilees, yeah, he was a great inventor and entrepreneur, and that's why he was already famous. People knew him as this great man. We know the story that his brother Haran died in a fire in Ul Kasdim. Uh, the rabbinic tradition, as in the Midrash and in many other places that, that Chazal speak about it, is that Nimrod, the king, arrested Abraham and told him to worship fire. And if he wouldn't worship the idols, he would throw him in a fire, in a, in a whatever, in a pyre of flames, in a furnace. Ul Kasdim, literally, Ul means fire in Aramaic. And so the rabbinic account is Abraham said, I'm not going to worship the idols. And he was thrown into the flame and he survived. And Haran, his brother, said, oh, well, okay, I guess God is real. And he decided to jump with him. But because his faith was insincere and he was really still in his heart a pagan idolater, he died in the flames in Ul Kazdim. Haran died in the flames. 
That's the Midrashic account. Here it's a different account. Here the account is, Avraham was arguing with his father, Terach, who, as we know, sold idols and had idols. And Terach said, yeah, you know what? I agree with you. There is only one God. But if I change my tune here, they're going to kill me. Like if I close, sh- close up shop, they're going to think I'm crazy. So I have to keep going. So what Avraham did is he set the house on fire. That's how he destroyed all the idols. In rabbinic tradition, he had them, he smashed them all with a hammer. We know the story. And put the hammer in one, whatever. So, but here, Avraham actually burns down the house with all the idols. And Haran goes in to save the idols and dies in that fire. So it's a different death by fire in the book of Jubilees. Then God teaches Abraham Hebrew, the divine language, because, which had been forgotten since Migdal Bavel, since God confounded all the languages in the Tower of Babel. Where did Hebrew go? Nobody knew the divine language of the angels. Now God restores it to Abraham. Abraham also celebrates Shavuot. Right? The book of Jubilee says that it was on the 15th of Sivan that God made a covenant with Abraham. That's when Abraham circumcised himself. That's when uh, he was told that Yitzhak would be born. And Yitzhak was born the following Shavuot on the 15th of Sivan. So again, at odds with rabbinic tradition, which puts that on Pesach. But according to Jubilees, it was on Shavuot. And then this is really interesting. It says that the angels told him he's not only going to have one more son, after he'll have six more kids, which we know he did with Keturah. And so Abraham was apparently so happy about this that he decided to institute Sukkot to celebrate his additional children, his seven non-Jewish children who are not Yitzhak. And so Jubilees argues that the seven days of Sukkot are really parallel Abraham's other children from whom all the nations of the world would descend from, which is why on Sukkot they used to sacrifice 70 bulls, one for each of the 70 nations. Very interesting. That's what it's a, that's a new chidush from Jubilees. The, the, the seven days of Sukkot corresponded to Abraham's seven non-Itzhak children who would not get any inheritance, but he instituted this holiday originally for them. Very interesting. And apparently Abraham also did a lulav and etrog and did a akafot seven times. Amazing. So the book of Jubilees is actually one of the earliest sources of akafot. Is there anything that speaks about Akafot before this? I'm not sure. So you have like a, an ancient source for Akafot circling. He circled the altar seven times with his love and the In the Second Temple era. Now, it claims to have been written on Har Sinai. Right? The Book of Jubilees claims to be the revelation given to Moshe on Har Sinai. Now, according to scholars based on the language and all of that, they think it was written probably in the second century BCE. So, century BCE. According to scholars. Right, because if the ECE in it, yeah. if you found 15 copies of these, yes. or whatever, in the, in the, at the height of the Second Temple era. Second temple, yes, right. according to scholars. Could have been earlier, right? right. It, it didn't make it into the Tanakh originally in the first compilation, probably because it didn't exist yet. Like, that's, you know, right, well, what about Hanoch? Yeah. Is Hanoch a more ancient? Hanoch is dated to the same time. It has the same language, it has the same content, oh, so it's dated to the same God. time. Pro- possibly by the same author, even. Or the same group of authors, we don't know. Okay, aside from that, uh, what else is interesting? It says that Yitzhak blessed uh, Yaakov's children, that Yaakov came to visit Yitzhak before he passed away, but he only took with him. He didn't take the whole family with him. He only took Levi and Yehuda. And so Yitzhak blessed Levi and Yehuda, which presumably is why those are the two tribes that survived till today. Because today we only know of two tribes, right? Everybody is either a Yehuda or a Levi, Kohen Levi, right? But Benjamin was also... Yeah, but nobody knows today if they're Benjamin. We're all Yehudim or you're a Levi. So Jubilees kind of gives, seems to give an explanation for that, that because Yitzhak only blessed these two, they would survive for forever. And interestingly also, it says, how did Levi become the priestly class? What is the origin of that? Why Levi? So we know why, because of the golden calf thing. But before that, it says that Yaakov promised to God, remember, that whatever God gives him, he will give him ma'asel. Remember this? That's clear in the Torah. When God spoke to Yaakov, Yaakov said, whatever you give me, I give you a tenth. So Jubilee says he lined up his sons and he went from the youngest one. He started counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So who's the tenth youngest from the bottom up is Levi, because Levi is the third child. So the third from the oldest is the tenth from the youngest, right? So because he was the tenth, Yaakov said, okay, you're going to be the priest. You're the ma'asel. You're going to be the priest. You're going to serve God. That's what Jubilee says, that he counted his children from the youngest up, and Levi was the tenth. So he would be the tithe. 
<laughs> so that's the cute Vietnam, stuff. Also... Where to say that? Yeah, that's probably it. So Pirkei de Rabi is the Midrash that quotes most often from, that has the most overlaps with Jubilees. Also another Midrash called Midrash Tadshe quotes a lot from Jubilees. And then uh, Jubilees also tries to make everybody as righteous and good as possible. So it actually solves all the issues that the Torah raises. So it says, for example, that at the end of his life, Itzhak realized that Esav was a bad kid and he loved Yaakov more. And he realized that Yaakov is the right son and loved Yaakov. It says he also loved Leah, that after Rachel passed away, she finally grew on him. And this is what it says, that he loved Leah with all his heart and soul. And he realized that she was perfect and never said anything negative. So it gives like a happy ending to the Yaakov Leah story. Because the Torah seems to say that Yaakov hated her, you know, or at least didn't like her as much as Rachel. But Jubilees comes in and fixes that and says, no, 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 after Rachel passed away, he had a great time with Leah, loved her. And, you know, they lived happily ever after. And finally, it says, Esav also repented and was, was wanted to be righteous, but his sons were evil. And his sons said, absolutely not. We're going to fight the children of Yaakov for the land. And they convinced Esav to go to war with his brother. And they, they got an army of 4,000 people. And so this is a great Hollywood battle that Jubilees describes that Yaakov summoned all his children. They had their army. Esav had his army. They went to battle. They fought valiantly. And amazingly, Jubilee says that Yaakov took a bow and arrow and shot Esav with an arrow. And that's how Esav died. Yeah. And then the rest fled in fear. Very different from the rabbinic tradition. Our tradition is that Yaakov died first. And when the children came to bury him in Merat HaMachpelah, in the cave of the patriarchs, Esav came and tried to block it. And Chushim, the grandson of Yaakov, was deaf and said, what's going on? He just went and chopped off Esav's head. And Esav's head rolled into the cave of the patriarchs. So that's a different Midrash story. Actually, the book of Jubilee says that in the Torah, Chushim is named as the only son of Dan. But Jubilee says that he had other kids, just that they all died in Egypt. And only Chushim survived. So Dan had other children originally. Okay, that's the story. And it says that Yaakov actually buried Esav at the end. So Yaakov buried Esav in Edom, in Aidumea. The story comes to an end. Okay, and just to finish with, and we're done, because we want to talk about Mashiach and the end of days, Acharit Ayamim. The Jubilees does give a prophecy for the end of days. And again, it overlaps with what Chazal say, like in Masechet Sota, in Sanhedrin, about, we've explored this before, what the world will be like at the end of days. And Jubilees also tells us what the world will be like at the end of days. It says, Uvayamim ha'em, ki ish yovel v'chetzi, when a person will live just a jubilee and a half, which is like, you know, 75 years, az yomru alav ki arich yamim. That'll be considered an old man. And Jubilee says that they will come, we'll go back to the lifespans of Adam and Eve and those that lived 900 years, 1,000 years, which Ishayahu says also, Isaiah prophesizes that a day will come when a person who's 100 will be considered a baby. And Jubilees reinforces that as well. And it says that there, before that happens, though, there will be a very terrible generation. The fi- at the end of days, there will be madve, vekeev, vekev beten, uh, all kinds of sicknesses, and, and specifically kev beten, interestingly, stomach problems and digestive issues. Think about the world today and how digestive issues are probably the most rampant when it comes to health, all the different things that people have, <clears throat> dietary issues. Ubarad, the Kerach, the Sheleg, and all kinds of intense weather phenomena, the Kipa climate, climate, yeah. climate change, yes. Global, global yes. Climate, uh, Hail, ice, snow, frost, uh, um, an ice age. Dr- drought, yeah, climate change is coming, the Mavet, the Cherev, and wars, and all kinds of things. Kolzot, Botavo, Alador, Hara. All of this will come to that evil generation. Amemaleta Ta'aretz, Hamas that fills the world with lawlessness, just like the word Hamas, the same word that was used in the pre-flood generation. But Tum'at Znunim, again, they were going to be sexually impure, sexually immoral, and we know the world has plenty of that today. And then, Lo shalom there won't be any peace in that time. So this parallels what the Talmud says, that the children will fight with their parents. You know, there will be no respect for the elders and all of that. And everybody in general, people will leave the covenant of God and will no longer keep his, uh, his laws. And 
It continues to say, There will be a lack of food, oil, wine. I'm just skipping ahead. People will fight each other's civil wars. The young against the old. The poor will fight with the rich. Right? And the anikalim benichbadim. So, you know, the elites will be fighting with the common folk like we see today all around us. Uh, people will come and steal from each other. They will uh, take spoils and, and spoil wealth. To take something that's not theirs. Everybody's going to be looking for to be a YouTube star and to be on Instagram and to, on TikTok to have a Shem Gadol. Everybody's going to want to be famous. But not, you know, no truth and no faith. No sincereness, thank you. Everything that's holy they will profane. And so they will pollute everything and corrupt everything. So it's a pretty good description of our world. And God will arise against them. Chotim, people who are sinners, asher lo yachosu, who will not have mercy on them. Velo yisu pnei kol ish zaken v'na'ar, and will destroy both young and old. That you, you mean population control? Population control, whoever. Sinners who will try to take control of the world and will, will not care for human life, young or old, if you want to call that population control, or whatever it is, you know. Anyway, anashim ra'im, wicked people, leman yar'u la'asot mikol b'nei adam, so basically, God is going to use these wicked people to punish human beings. And it keeps going and talking about all the terrible things that will happen. And uh, people will, nobody will be satisfied. Nobody will live in peace and enjoy. Uh, and, and, but finally, finally, people will come back to Hashem. In those days, the children will begin to study. They will finally come back to the righteous path and their lives will finally lengthen again from generation to generation. Until we go back to living as God intended for a thousand years. So as we go back to a perfect world, God will restore our health and our lifespans, and finally we will come to a day where it will be kol yamem v'shalom v'simcha, that we will come to a day full of peace and joy. Post, post Mashiach. Now, interestingly, no, interestingly, it does not mention a Mashiach, although other commentaries on this say, if you read between the lines, in, in other places, maybe it does expect some messianic figure, but it's not explicit that there will be a Mashiach, just have faith in Hashem. God will save you. That's the important thing. And finally, uh, there will not be ein satan ve ein mashchit. There will no longer be Satan or the evil angels. And God will heal everybody. And so we'll finally have joy and peace. And everybody will know God, that he is just. That God does kindness to hundreds and to thousands and to everybody. And God will be kind and merciful to all who love him. And then it ends by saying, Moses, Moshe, ktov lecha et adavar So again, it's saying that this is what was revealed to Moses to write these things. In the Be'edut Luchot HaShamayim Ledorot Olam. To write it in the heavenly tablets forever. So a day will come, God willing, soon, when God will heal us all and give us peace and joy. And we'll live again a thousand years like we were meant to. May we see that day soon, and we'll end with that. Thank you very much.